I have the pleasure today of interviewing Betty Hollingsworth and talking about memories of South Deerfield. Betty, can you tell us about how your family, going back several generations, came to this area and how they came to South Deerfield? My family was originally residents of the town of Hatfield. I was born in Hatfield. My father and mother, my father was born in Hatfield, my mother was born in Whiteley. My father's family goes back generations to Miles Standish, who came over and was uh, one of the administers of the colony and came off the Mayflower. My mother's family was when my grandfather, Dennis Hayes, came to this country in 18, he was born in 1830, he came here in 1850, and he went on board a, a sailing ship from County Cork, Ireland to Liverpool and then took the George Washington out of, Bos of Boston, which was the name of the ship, and came across the ocean on that sailing ship. Now I have a copy of the um, manifest of that ship. There were 790 passengers on board, of which he was passenger number 220. He landed before it was Ellis Island, before it was Castle Garden, before it was the Battery, when there was only a, a port there. And, and that's when he came into this country in 1853. He came to Whateley, and I have to assume that he came either, there were railroads at that time, so possibly he came in, in on the railroad, or maybe he came up the river on a riverboat. That's something I don't know. But when he came to Whateley, he bought a half a house. And then he worked for the town of Whateley. He worked building bridges. He worked on roads. He worked um, hard, what they called hardening of roads, which I assume in the springtime was when they drew a, a large log over the roads in order to keep the, the mud down for, so that the carriages could go through. And in the wintertime, he did the same thing, which was called hardening of the roads. And I assume then that they smoothed out the ruts from the snow so that the sleighs could go over it easily. Why did he leave Ireland? He left Ireland because Ireland was going through the potato famine and there was not enough work for people. Um, I think he was looking forward to coming to the New World, to America, and um, start a new life, which he did. After he was here in Whiteley, eight years later, he bought the other half of the house. And then um, started, he sent for his wife from Ireland, uh, and she came over, and they had eight children, of which there were two boys and four girl, and six, six girls. And um, all of the younger children died very young. Only the two older girls um, remained alive. Dennis Hayes' uh, wife died when the, when the young children died. So he lost both his wife and, and all of the younger children. After he remained a widower for a, a, a number of years, um, he, was, he was growing tobacco and he was raising animals. He had animals on the farm. He had a small spread there where he'd bought the half a house and then the, finally the, the whole house, and then went down and bought a lot further on down Straits Road in Waitley which was known as Hopal in those days. Um, they used that lot for growing tobacco and uh, also for grazing the, the, the cattle that they had. They also had pigs and he had a large barn and the barn was very well equipped. Um, it, was, it was a horse stable and it was um, a pig pen out back and it even had a bathroom in the, in the barn, which they did in those days because they had no indoor toilets. Uh, the the uh, house was had a corn crib out beside it, I remember. It had a, a well and the old-fashioned pump that they pumped the water into the sink. My grandmother came from Czechoslovakia, and I think, I don't have any record of how she got here, but I think she probably came either by train or came up by boat and possibly stopped off 
at that area because the river road ran just behind my, my grandfather's property. And so it was an easy access from the road up to, to the farm. And what he did was he kept what was known as tramps in those days. And he was paid by the town of Whateley to keep tramps. I have the, the records of all of that. Um, I think she probably can, because she was a young girl. He was probably 56 to 58 years old when she came through. And obviously, she must have had some cooking skills that he enjoyed. And she was invited to stay. And they finally married. Now, then came the second family, of which there were two boys and a girl. The girl was the youngest. And I'm the daughter of the girl. And of course, that's why I can say my grandfather was born in 1830, because it, it was a, a lot of years that, that, that people yearned to come to America, and he finally achieved his dream. I have his naturalization papers. I have the, the manifest on the ship that he came in on. Uh, there, um, there were other records that I have been able to keep. And um, finally, um, my dad's family was a, a large family. There were 11 children in his family. He um, lived at, the, and, and all the boys worked on the farm. They grazed potatoes. That was their main crop. But there was also some tobacco and, and onions grown at that time, because it was a big onion growing area. His parents were Alf Harris and Estelle House. Yes, Alfred and Estella. And also, I have um, copies of pictures of my great-grandmother, which was his grandmother. And um, I've been able to keep all of those pictures in my albums. And what did Alf Harris do for a living in Hatfield? They raised, they raised potatoes. They were a big potato farmer. Um, they did not have modern-day equipment, so everything had to be done with the horse and the plow. And they raised crops on Brad Street all the way to the river. I can remember chestnut trees being there, butternut trees being down in the meadow, and all of those have disappeared now. There, there's no trace of any of that. Um, I, can re I was born in the house next door to that. I wasn't born in the Harris homestead. My, my twin brothers, Don and John, were born at Mrs. Abbey's birthing home over in Sunderland, but I was born in the house next door. And I have, some, I have a memory that has stayed with me all my life. I can remember as a child, I was about two years old, and I was standing up in the crib and crying my eyes out. Evidently, nobody was listening to me and didn't come and pick me up and take me out. And I have visions, I had visions of that room which had a sloping roof and a window, and those have stayed with me throughout my life. We had um, a 90th Harris reunion at the old family homestead, and the Sadlowskis, who own it now, were very good in taking us through the main house, which was good because I, I spent a lot of time there. My brothers went through the barn, which they enjoyed because they had tended horses out there when they were kids. And then they asked me if I wanted to go next door. Now, this was in 1990 that we had that final uh, reunion. And so I went in and went upstairs. and. It was just like a walk back in time. That room was exactly as I remembered it, with the sloping roof, just minus the crib, that's all. <laughs> so Phil Harris, your... Uh, Phil and Susie were my mother and father. Right, Phil Harris had, do I have it right, 10 siblings? 11, there Ele were 11 Ele children Ele in the family, right. right, right. And um, he was bound out. As a, as a, can you talk about that as yes. a youngster? Um, in 1865, Oliver Smith came into Northampton. Um, he was a man who had amassed quite a bit of wealth. And he decided that he wanted to leave some money to the, the, com well, to the, the county, because Northampton, Hatfield, Deerfield, Sunland, Whateley were involved in this Oliver Smith will that he left. And it was a charity that would allow young people to go to live with a family to learn trades. They could learn to become, in the case of ladies, they could learn to become housekeepers. They could learn to cook, to bake. And you had to spend two years living with the family. 
In the case of the boys, my brother John was bound out to C.E. Parsons, who was an electrician, and he learned the electrical trade and went on to beca become the state examiner of electricians. And um, when you finished your term of two years, then you got $200 at that time. But in, that, in those days, that was a lot of money. Um, it's not the same today. I believe they get $600 today, and it's still going on today. So any youngster that is worthy and applies to the Smith Charities and is accepted can do the same thing. So Phil, was your, your father was bound out as a carpenter, but he also learned to become a farmer. Is that right? With he was potatoes? a farmer. He was a farmer to begin with by trade because he had to be in order to help the family with the potato crop. Um, he, in being bound out, I, he, he, he lived in Bradstreet in, White, in Hatfield, and my mother lived on Straits Road in Waitley, and he was bound out to Tot Smith, who was on Straits Road in Waitley. So I have a feeling that either on his motorcycle, or with his horse, or with his wagon, he went by my mother's house, and that's how they become acquainted. Uh -huh. Let's go back to uh, Susan Hud. Hadbob. Hadbob. Yes. Tell me about her life growing up, because I think soon, some years after she married uh, Dennis Hayes, he died. Yes, she he did. She had children now to support. How did she do it? Dennis died when my mother was seven years old. And um, she had a tough life, but she turned to the t growing tobacco, and that was her cash crop. That's once a year when the tobacco was sold, and that's when they had the money, and they knew how to budget effectively so that they didn't overspend but she had farm animals she had a milk cow she had chickens there was always uh, and pigs there was always a way to um, have an, an animal rend swattered and rendered because it provided them with the bacon and the hams and everything and um, in the olden days things were smoked or um, put down and under salt and um, a lot of the, the my, a lot of the stories that I have been able to gather from family members tells of the rendering of the uh, of the of the pork and the, the scraps that was what they called the, the the leavings from that were boiled and in oil and um, and the stories just told of, of everything that happened when there was no electricity no lighting no telephones. Certainly no computers in those days, but life, life was a lot different. Life was very slow moving and yet very productive because they, atten they put all their attention to growing their crops and keeping their home and raising their families. And with grandma, she came from Czechoslovakia. It was a little town called Ubres, which was on the border of Czechoslovakia at that time, which was Czechoslovakia and Russia. And then, of course, with the war, it was altered to become Slovakia. Um, she I had a, um, a good life when she was in Czechoslovakia, and we have been in touch with relatives over there. Now, she came ahead of the rest of the family. She was the forerunner. And then came the Duda family, and that was her nephew. She was aunt and nephew to that family. And they, she helped them with their passage to come into this country. And the Duda family came on, and then they just started a house just south of where she lived. Let's talk a bit about your family. Yes. And, and your uh, childhood. I'd like to spend a little more time. Okay. Growing up, uh, what did you and your friends do for fun? What would your well, family do for well, fun as first a family? Of all, first of all, Ken, I moved here when I was two years old. Right. So I started from a very young age, and we moved into the 230 North Main Street home where we shared with Mr. Parsons and his daughter, and later on his daughter's husband. Um, it was, um, my father didn't have much money coming in, my mother didn't have much money coming in. They did not earn a salary, as I remember it. My mother worked a time for Western Mass Electric Company before she demonstrated appliances for C.E. Parsons. She worked for Western Mass Electric Company when they were located up on Federal Street in Greenfield, where one of the banks now reside. Um, she 
was mainly a housekeeper. Uh, she did a lot of baking. There, there were, she had to stay home. There were eight of us in the family. My grandmother was sick and was living with us in the, at that time. My two brothers, my father, we had a baby brother. And at that time, we had a girl who was bound out to us through the Oliver Smith Charities. We also had a state boy who was living with us who came to live with us when my family were in Hatfield and moved with us to South Deerfield. And he lived with us until he went into the service in World War II. When you say a state boy, what does that mean? That means that he was a child well, on the welfare of the, of the city of Boston that either the parents could not take care of them or chose not to take care of them, that either one parent was either deceased or missing, and they became wards of the state. The state took them over, and in order to give them a um, normal life, so to speak, they, in all sense of the word, bound them out to other, to families throughout the western part of the state. And Charlie lived with us all those years. Um, he was a member of the family. Um, my mother cooked. My mother, my mother made eight loaves of bread every other day. She cooked. She made pies. She did all of the canning. We, we, my dad grew a big garden. In those days, there were no freezers, so in order to preserve the food, you had to can it. And I can tell you, there were lots of quarts of fresh veg of vegetables, fruits. Um, she even um, canned what she called mincemeat, which was made from the deer that my father shot. And we processed and ground into partially into meat to make mincemeat pies out of. Mm -hmm. What was Charlie's last name? Do you remember? Driscoll. Driscoll. Yes. He, when he left us, after he went into the service, he married, while he was in the service, married a girl from Greenfield, and then became a police officer in Greenfield. And he was alive up until probably five or six years ago. That's a real success story. Oh, yes. Let's talk about some of your friends in childhood and how you develop friends. What did you base your friendships on? Well, you know, as, as a kid, I think meeting people was a lot easier. You went up to somebody and you said hi and, you know, you want to play a game or you want to go shopping or do you want to do something? And everybody was more agreeable in those days. And I had a girlfriend who lived just down the street and she and I became very good friends and we still to this day remain friends even though she does not live in town. She moved out to be with her daughter. But um, we played together, we played house, um, we played baseball in the evening after we got home from school. We always got home, changed our school clothes into play clothes, went out to play, maybe came home for supper if we were hungry, went back out and played until dark. And mom and dad never ever had to worry about us in those days. It's just the fact that they told us we had to be home by dark, and we were. And you all went off and played in the woods or played on the streets? Different kinds of things. We, we played baseball a lot. We played hide and go seek. We played kick the can. We played go find. We played um, a number of games that kids played in those days. Dodgeball. Um, Lot, we had a good baseball team with all the kids in the neighborhood. These are boys and girls playing boys together. Boys and girls together, yeah, and we played. And we had a lot across the street from the house that the, was, was owned by the Kelleher family. And they had what they called a shack on it, because it was just a little old shack that they built for the kids so that they could go and have a playhouse to play in. And they had um, a stove in there so they could build a fire and they could cook things on the stove. And a lot of times we would all bring hot dogs and roast them in the open fire. Is this the 1940s, 1950s? What uh, period? No, this, this is late, late 30s. Late 30s? Yes. Okay. And how did you develop an interest in, I know you were passionate about skating and skiing. Yes. Was this something that other kids were doing or you just picked it up? How did that happen? Well, one, one, day, one Christmas, my aunt and uncle gave me a pair of, fig, of skates, but they weren't figure skates. They were a pair of boy skates because they didn't realize the difference. And um, I wore them for just a little while, and I, I had been watching Sonia Henney in the movies, and I wanted to emulate everything she did. So my mother bought me a pair of figure skates, and that's the way I started. 
but I started skating because there were no ponds or no rinks or anything around. Out behind our house where the football field currently exists for Frontier Regional School was the area that was dug to make way for the reconstruction of Route 5 and 10 because Route 5 and 10 came right straight through town and right down North Main Street and right into the center of town. And when they were reconstructing the highway, they went out there and dug the soil or the gravel and brought it and therefore made very big pockmarks in the soil, which when it rained, gathered water and it froze and that's where I first skated. And how old were you and what year is this oh, about? Oh, I probably was four to five years old at that time. Really? Yes. And then from there, they built the ice rink on the Kelleher property, which went from the bridge all the way to the bridge at Marty Barrett's property, because that was all open. That wasn't trees in those days. And I learned to, learned to do other things there from other people. And one day, a couple came along, and um, I noticed that they were very proficient in skating. They, they, they were doing all the fancy things that I used to see and wanted to do. What are some of the fancy things in well, skating? Well, figure, circle eight, figure eights is what we started. If you could do a figure eight, figure eight, that developed your edges, your inside and your outside edge and your front and your back edges, which you needed control over in order to control the different movements. And so Bob, his, his name was Bob Labarge, asked me if I wanted a spin. And he gathered <laughs> me underneath my arms and he spun me around and oh, it was wonderful. So I had another spin that day, and after the second one, and he had watched me skate, he said, you know, he said, we go to the Circle 8 Figure Skating Club in Northampton. So he invited me to go along, and since I was young and did not drive, they offered to drive me. And we used to go down, and then finally my mother would take me every night, and she would sit in the clubhouse, because they had a nice big picture window that she could watch us. And how old were you then? Well, that was from five until um, teenage years when that club, well, we, we moved from that club to the um, Little Sun Valley Skating Club in West Springfield, which was an outdoor rink, because there were no indoor rinks at that time. And then after the war years, Eastern States Coliseum be, was frozen over because they then had ice again. And so we used to go and skate there, and uh, we would do that three or four times a week. And my mother always used to take me, and she'd sit up in the stands with her afghan over her lap and watch us skate. But that was a fun time. And you became qu quite proficient and quite professional in your skating. Did you not? I mean, you were known throughout town in the valley as quite a skater. Yes. If people thought about you, they said, Betty, she's a skater. Is that right? Well, my, you know, when I was young also, and there were no rinks, my dad used to take me down when the when the fields flooded and he would let me off in, in Hatfield and he'd go on to Hatfield to visit relatives and leave me there to skate. So a lot of people pass by and I've had a lot of people tell me that they remember me skating there. But from that and my experience at the uh, Little Sun Valley and the Eastern States Exposition, I formed a skating a, a team with a skating partner that we did acrobatic skating, he and I, and Lil and Bob LaBarge did acrobatic skating, and we went on to participate in many carnivals up north, Newport, um, in, di different places up in the, in the northern part of New Hampshire and Vermont. And sometimes they would come down and tape us, and I remember one in particular event that we were going, and I had a, a pink costume, so I was billed as the pink lady. Uh -huh. and, that I remember very, very Had you very, thought of this as a career? No, because I wasn't good enough at that time. I, you know, I, I skated in many shows, and I went on to teach. I went on to teach skating at both the Brattleboro, Vermont rink, and it, I was one of the founding members of the Greenfield Figure Skating Club back in the 70s, early 70s. Can you talk about your work with uh, blind skaters? That's quite significant. Yes, um, we did have blind people come in, and um, by the use of a hockey stick, we, would ab we were able to skate around the rink with them. And of course, the blind skiing is a little bit different uh, tactic because we don't use a hands-on with the blind skiing. We use verbal commands and, and talk them down and talk them up and talk them onto the lift uh, after they became proficient in skiing. But um, I, I did not start skiing until later in life. Um, 
back when, right after I got married is when we really started skiing because uh, my husband Tom and I started out and then we had Tommy on skis when he was a year old. So that was a fun time. So you would take the blind skiers on the slopes and you would verbally give them directions as you were skiing down the slope? Yes, that's correct. We always had two instructor, what we called instructor guides, with each blind person. There was a primary instructor whose job it was to call the commands and guide, and then there was a secondary instructor who was there in case something happened and the primary instructor fell, for instance, then the secondary instructor could take over because you can't let a blind person keep going down the hill without somebody calling commands to him. And what was this group called? The Blind Ski Program, and, and it started at uh, what was then Thunder Mountain, which is now Berkshire East, and they uh, uh, had an advertisement. They wanted people to come in as instructors. I answered the ad. Um, evidently, they, was, they were needing some people to take over some of the leadership roles, and they wanted to know what we were going to call the group. And I said I thought it ought to be called Blind Ski Program, BLIND, for B. B-L-I-N-D for Blind Living in New Dimensions. Very and nice. that became our letterhead uh, for that particular time. How did you get started in skiing, by the way? How did, you, how did that happen? Actually, I had someone who uh, I had worked with took me up um, when, on the Mohawk Trail, there were two <coughs> ski areas. Um, there was one that had a, a ski toe and just a, a very short lift that you could ride and come down. And he took me up there, and it was a disaster. I did not do too well. But then when t Tom and I started to learn to ski, we basically went to another area up there, which had a bigger ski area, a better tow and instruction, so, and the long skis at that time. So that's where our careers began. Tell us about how you met Tom, how that relationship developed, and tell us about Tom and your marriage. Well, I am a USO volunteer, and I was in 1950 also a USO volunteer at the Holyoke um, War Memorial Building for people at Westover. And we had, um, uh, Monday night was the night we met, and we would uh, meet the men, have dancing, and camaraderie and conversation. A lot of them just wanted to sit and talk, and that's what we did. We always had a formal, once a month, we would have a formal dance. Uh, they'd have an orchestra, usually the Air Force Orchestra would play for us. And um, it, it, it just was a fun time. We decorated the hall in Christmas time. Um, we had a Christmas party. We we'd had sleigh rides, we had hay rides, we had swimming parties. We, we just did an awful lot of hands-on with the guys so that they had, could feel at home by way from the, home. During the Korean War? Yes, it was, 1950. And then, of course, after I got married, I, I stopped. How, well, how did you meet Tom? How did that happen? Well, he, at the War Memorial, <coughs> there was this particular night where I was in, in charge of the Halloween party, and we had that down cellar. We'd set up a haunted house with the slimy hands and the ghosts and all that stuff. And after I came up, um, uh, there were six of us girls that were involved in the committee that night. We got changed into our, clo our party clothes for dancing. And the first couple that came through the door, we'd been complaining, the girls. Every the, one of the guys that we'd been dancing with were too short. Well, this particular night, in through the door walked these two young airmen, and they were tall. And one asked me to dance. And we did, we, we danced the all, you're not supposed to dance exclusively with one person, but we did the whole first half. And I explained to him that I had to go back down to the haunted house because I was in charge of that, but we'd be back for refreshments and, and I'd meet him there afterward. But when I came back, he was not there. Now, fast, that was October, fast forward to May of the next year. There was a, a sports car hop at Westover and all six of us girls went and we went in through the hangar door. It was in Hangar 9, and it was a humongous hangar. And the Air Force Band was playing, and we had our backs to the open door. And I felt this tap on my shoulder. And this person said, may I have this dance? And I turned around, and I said, I know you. You're Tom. I met you at Holyoke. And that's the way I met Tom, and that's 
that's the way we dated. And um, where was Tom from, and how did he? How did he? How did he ask you to marry him and move up here? Where? What? How did that happen? Well, Tom had been in Tripoli, Libya, North Africa, for 18 months before I met him. And uh, after I met him, of course, I was uh, uh, on lifeguard duty at Asheville Lake. And so when we dated, he had to come along, and he didn't like that because he didn't have exclusive use of my time. But anyway, he said to me afterward, he said, don't you dare ask me to take you on a picnic or anywhere where there's a beach or sand, because he said, I've had enough sand in Tripoli, Libya, North Africa to last me a lifetime. Now, Tom was from West Tennessee. Um, he came from a, a family of people who were born and raised there. Uh, unfortunately, his father died while he was in Tripoli. Um, his mother and had two younger children that Tom was trying to support through his uh, money that he got from the service. And Tom was working at the officers club, so I, our dates were restricted because he had to work, he had to earn funds. And at that time I didn't realize that he was sending his paycheck home to his mother and what he was living on was his tips from working at the officers club. But anyway, um, when that, when his tour of duty ended there, he'd enrolled in the, in the University of Tennessee and had to go back to Tennessee because he was discharged on a Friday and he had to be in classes on Monday. So he hot-footed it out of there and I wrote every day for a while and then I wrote every two days and then once a week and then once a month. And I thought, I'm never gonna see this guy again. And I stopped writing. Well, about almost two years later, I got a telephone call and it was Tom's voice, and he said, this is Tom. He said, can I have a date? And I said, where are you? And he says, I'm in Detroit, Michigan. And I said, what are you doing in Detroit, Michigan? He said, well, I'm working for Great Lakes Steel. And I said, how are you going to have a date with me from Detroit, Michigan? <laughs> yeah. And he said, well, if I work um, the month, he said, I can work overtime and get five days in a row off, and I'll drive over to see you. So he did, and we did. Now, it took him two days to drive over. We had about 24 hours together, and then two days to drive back. And that's the way we conducted our courtship, because he was, he was there in, in Great Lakes. And finally, I said to him, you know, I said, he, you're gonna get killed on that highway, because he was traveling in the snow, when the snow was deep out right. there along the, there was no New York Thruway at that time, it was just old Route 20. And um, I said to him, you know, you ought to come here and see if somebody has something that, that you could do for work. Well, he had done surveying work in the service. So I suggested he go to see Gordon Ainsworth. He did, and Gordon offered him a job. And fortunately, they were building the mass turnpike at that time. So he went right to work. And shortly after that, he proposed to me on Valentine's Day, and we got married on May 23rd. 1956. And he, um, and what house did you move into then? Where did you live? We, we were living in the house we currently are living in because by that time we had already built the new house. Um, he, uh, he, he and I, you know, had. When you say we built a new house, who do you mean we built? Well, my father, I, I purchased the land from Charlie Dean. And um, then we proceeded to build the house there. We had the cellar hole dug, um, built the house. You and your and Tom. My, yes, it, we, all of the family ch uh, chimed Worked in. Worked together. Uh, we did not have any professional help. Um, my dad did all of the carpentry work. My brother did all the electrical work, and the other brother did all the plumbing. This is work. the house you moved in with Tom. That's right. That's right. Uh huh. Uh huh. And. Uh, at that point, the whole area was getting further developed also. When you it started in. after we moved in because Mr. Wolfham, who lived next door to us, and the people who lived across diagonally across the street were the last two houses on the street at that time. But now the street is full completely to the mountain. Let's, let's return to your work with USO, but I want to talk about um, the 1930s and the 40s and the war. Mm -hmm. And both of your brothers fought in the war? Yes, they correct? did, World War II. And they saw service overseas, or were they here? 
No, um, my, both of my brothers, my brothers were twins, and they were both um, inducted the same day, went on the train the same day, went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and stayed together. Um, at one point, the, there was a notice on the bulletin board that they were looking for candidates for the ASTP program, which was the Army Specialized Training Program, which if you went to the University of Colorado and graduated, you graduated as an officer. So both boys took the exam. Now there were 600 odd people, young men, who took that exam, because it was all young men at that time. And out of that, my brother John came in first, and my brother Don came in third uh, on, on the scoring. So of course they got shipped off to, to Colorado. And uh, they were in Fort Collins, Colorado for oh, about a year and a half. And then when the intensity of the war in Europe became so great that the need for infantry <coughs> members w was eminent, they just canceled the program, canceled out everything, put them back in the infantry. And they went off to Europe? No, no, they went back to Fort Leonard Wood. And my brother Don had been with someone at that ASTP program who had some other careers. And he said to the guy, he says, if there's anything that you think I can do, sign me up for it. So they did. And Don finally went into the Signal Corps. Oh. And he, that was the, what he stayed in, Alden. But John stayed as an infantryman. John got shipped overseas to Europe. He um, was in Britain for uh, England for a long time, then went to um, participate in Patton's Battle of the Bulge. And he was a machine gunner, and he was wounded in January of uh, 44. 44. And when he, of course, laid in the foxhole wounded, he froze his feet. And finally, when the medics got to them, um, they were able to uh, gather him up and, and take him off the battlefield. And on the way, he had seen a Nazi flag flying in a, um, a building that was over there. And so the guys said to him, would you like that flag? And he said, I would like it. So they went and got the flag for him and he brought that flag home. Mm. Now, um, he went back to England and was in the hospital for an extended period of time. But then they found out that he was an electrician. So they put him to work as an electrician in the hospital. And he stayed in that hospital beyond the <coughs> end of the war because although he had more points than Don did, Don went all across Europe as, um, in fact, Don worked on the Sigaba, which was the secret decryptograph machine. And um, that was his chore. And they strung the line of communication for the generals Everywhere they went, the generals were never out of touch with their troops. And he went all the way to um, uh, Nuremberg and then was shipped to Marseille, France, awaiting shipment to Japan to participate in the Battle of Japan. And he got to the can uh, Panama Canal and he noticed that the ship was heading north and not through the canal. Of course, they wouldn't tell him anything. Right. But they found out when they landed in, I believe it was Charleston, South Carolina, that the war was over with and that he was going to be discharged. How did, how did your commitment and devotion to veterans begin? Is it from seeing your brothers in the service? Because you've devoted a good piece of your life toward memorials for the veterans, toward observance of Veterans Day, toward putting up memorials to the veterans. Can you speak to how that happened and what kind of work you've done? Ken, it began way back when, when the boys were in the service. And in those days, you had a little flag that you put in the window. It was a, a, a red border with a white background with a blue star. And if you had two, you had two blue stars. And if you had three, three blue stars and so on. Now those flags were in everybody's window who had a veteran, had a, had a man serving in the war. If the man was killed, that star was changed to gold. And there were a number of gold star mothers in, in the, our town at that time. Now, from that time on, because I accepted the telegram when my brother was wounded, and I was just 10 or 12 years old, and in those days, when you saw a car pull up and uniformed officers get out and approach your 
door, you knew something was wrong. And I suspected he had been killed because mm -hmm. I knew he was in the thick of the battle. And when they came to the door, I just screamed. I will not accept the telegram. I, I don't know why I thought that not accepting the telegram would make it any better. Mm. But um, finally, they did come back the next day when my mother and dad were home and presented them with the telegram. But it was to announce that he had been wounded and was now being shipped back to England for hospitalization. But since that time, I've always had, and, and my service, because of my husband Tom being in the Korean War, um, I just felt as though I needed to do something that would help the veterans, and that's the way it started. Can you speak to some of the things you've done in terms of helping veterans and uh, in town specifically? Well, we did start through, I'm a member of the Memorial Day Committee, and Doug Tierney, who's chairman, uh, went down to his son's house in near Boston and saw a sign on a signpost and it was in honor of veterans who had been killed in action and he thought what a good idea so he came back with it and we sat down um, Doug and John Sizz in town and myself were appointed as the the uh, people to be on this particular committee for the signs we um, decided who was going to do what I was going to do the research um, the other man would do the publicity and that kind of thing, the contacts. And I sat about, to, well, we sat about, first of all, to discover how many young men in town had been killed. And at that time, you know, we, didn't, we only thought of World War II. We didn't think of, well, and, and, the, and the, uh, the Vietnam War, because no one in, in town was killed in the Korean War. But when we started to look into it, we discovered that we didn't have 10 or 12. We had 24 young men who had been killed in the war, all the way from the Spanish-American War in 1898 to the Iraq War uh, in, in uh, 2002 when uh, Sergeant Greg Belanger was killed. And through that, I gained an insight into what some of these young men had accomplished and what the conditions were under which they died which was very, very difficult to write about. Sometimes <laughs> I would write about it and the tears would be streaming down my cheeks because of the situation. Mm -hmm. When you take the Johnson brothers, the two boys, both lieutenants, one was a second lieutenant, one was a first lieutenant, both on bombing runs over Germany, and both of them were killed five days apart. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wrote. Can you imagine a mother's agony at getting that telegram? And I still tear up. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of things I learned in writing, and I had a help from a lot of people who contributed. I wrote, read a lot of books, did a lot of research, and um, found a lot of facts. And in, in fact, I have to tell you this kind of a interesting one. On the Spanish-American War, the young man was killed in Cuba, in the Cuban War. And um, I went down to Cape Coral and went to the military museum down there. And they had a large plaque sign that would fill the side of the, of the room. And they had all of the wars that were listed on it. And I looked at that and I went over to the man at the desk and I said, you've left the Spanish-American War off of that. I said, we had one man killed in the Spanish-American War. Well, that set a few chairs a-rustling, and, and they got some people together, and they took down some facts from me, and they said that the next time I came in there, they would have the sign repaired with the Spanish-American War. But if I had not done the research, I wouldn't have known that. So the town now has, on many different street corners, markers yes. and memorials to the residents of town who died fighting for our country. Well, when we first talked about where we should put the signs and how we should display them, of course the sign is a large sign which is the size of the street sign. And I said, you know, I think these ought to be put on the street where the veteran lived. So that's what we decided to do. So every veteran who lived on a street, we plot the street sign out so that it can be viewed from the main thoroughfare. 
and um, all over town, east, west, north, south, we have street signs covering. The Memorial Day um, event, shall we say, celebration of the, of the sacrifice of our soldiers is a major event in town. It's yeah. probably the major event of the year with a tremendous turnout and soldiers parading and the town parading. Would you say that you have on your committee young people also? Is there an interest in perpetuating it? Or are most of the people involved people in their 60s and older, and the younger people don't seem to be as interested? What have you noticed in terms of what's been happening, in terms of interest in the military and these kinds of events? Well, it, it, people's interests wane, depending upon what's happening in the world. And we do have a committee that is, consists of mostly older people, but there, there's a little young blood in there. And uh, hopefully some of that will be able to carry on um, should any one of us step down. And um, I, I, would, I would certainly hope that, that, that a new monument is developed because we're running out of space for places to put veterans' names. Um, we need an, an additional uh, area to put that monument, and uh, I hope that the planning will include that, that, that is planning for the uh, uh, center of town. So that's part of the thinking they're talking about, redeveloping the center yes. of town and to beautify it and, yeah. and uh, yeah, make that, it more appealing. That know. monument is full right now with, with the veterans of all the wards, and of course that monument, you do not have to be a deceased veteran to be on it. In fact, um, the names of the deceased is indicated by a star beside their name. Um, Who actually made these memorials? Who created them? How were they? Well, the, the original one is to World War I, which is on the common, and that contains members who were killed in action. Mm -hmm. um, then I think when World, World War II, people were very conscious about recognizing the veterans, and there was a there were many signs. In our church, we always had a sign with the names of all the veterans on it. And that stood in the, behind the, in the back entry of the church for a long time, until probably maybe the end of the, of the Korean War. Oh, really? And, <clears throat> um, and I think it was the same. And, and, and the organizations would put their members' names on. And, and the fact that they were either, you know, if they were deceased, it, the gold star was opposite. Can you remember when the memorial went up and who created it? Who was, you know, who actually built it? This World War II one and then the Korean one and the Vietnam one. I don't know who was on the original committee for that. Um, I'd have to do some research But do you that. know um, the other ones who built, actually physically built them, how it came about? Um, it was built uh, built by a monument company, by the um, Nemus Market, um, Mim Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, anyway, and there was a committee in town. There that was put a committee in town together. who did that. But as the wars ceased to be a popular, um, interest waned, and committees dropped their members. And it was only after I think um, the start of of the fighting in in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and our unfortunate loss of Sergeant Gregg, that we started to recognize those things and, and bring back some of the tri tributes that we need to be paying to these people. Mm. Well, thank you for the work you've done. I want to acknowledge that. It's really very important. Thank you. Let's go back to, uh, leap back to your childhood a bit. Can you tell us about your work experience, your first jobs and the kinds of jobs, briefly, the kinds of jobs you had what you found most interesting, what you found pretty awful. And I know you've got a tremendous work ethic and how'd that all come about? Give us a sense of the jobs and what was here to, what, what did kids do for work? Well, it started with babysitting. That's where I got my, my start. And I did a lot of babysitting for the Wolfham family. All of the older people who had children, I think I babysat for every one of them. Okay. And that then went on to um, when I was, my 12th birthday, I was working, I had been working as a chambermaid for a year at the Hotel Warren 
Um, it was then a residential hotel where people came in and stayed overnight. And beds had to be made and floors had to be swept and dusted and so on. So I was working as a chambermaid and I came in this particular Saturday morning and I was all exuberant and, and Mrs. Ahern said to me, why are you so happy? And I said, well, today's my 11th birthday. <laughs> Well, needless to say, that ended my job at the Hotel Warren. But, but that was wartime, and I walked down the street and went to Billings Drugstore and talked to Mr. and Mrs. Billings, and they hired me as a soda clerk. So I started as a soda clerk, and those, those were long hours because that was the time when Route 5 and 10 went through town. There was a lot of Sunday traffic, especially at leaf peeping time. People would stop and they'd be three deep at the counter and we'd be handing out ice cream cones and sixes and sevens. And um, we, I used to work there. There was a luncheonette. We prepared lunches for people. Um, we, You're all of 12, 13 years I old? Was, I was 12 years old when I went, when I went to work there. And this was not unusual for young people to be working No, like everybody worked because everybody wanted money. We all, we all got money for school clothes. That's the only way I could get, money, get school clothes was to earn the money for it because my folks weren't able to supply me with the things I need. My mother made my skirts and things, but you know, you had to have other accessories. So I babysat to earn the money. Was this common with a lot of your friends or the kids yes. in town? No, it People was like common. People kids had to yes. work. Yes, we had, a, we had a good work ethic back then. After I worked in the drugstore, um, I was going to work at four o'clock in the morning. I would ride my bicycle down because I had to, at that time do the papers. We didn't have paper paper boy delivery for the outer areas of the town. So I would pick up the papers in front of the store, take them in, write the names of the customers on them on specific routes, take them across the street because the post office was where um, the, the dentist office is right now, and the, off they would go so everybody had their morning paper on time. But that had to be done before 7 o'clock, before the post office opened up so that they could get it into their slots and to, able to be delivered. The post office delivered the papers? They, at that, that time, yes, yes. Uh -huh. That's the way they got their morning paper. When you say the outlying districts, what are you referring to? Well, East Deerfield, West Deerfield, Pine Nook, um, down uh, uh, what now is uh, the area of Whateley going down into the, the parts of town that the mail delivery covered at that time, they delivered the papers to everybody, but not in town because the paper boys and girls did the in-town paper delivery. So you were a chambermaid over at Hot L. Were you also working in other hotels in town? Can you continue your career? Give yes, us a sense yes, of it. Yes, I did. I worked uh, as um, a waitress at the Bloody Brook. Now, at that time, I was not 21 years old, so I couldn't work in the main dining room serving liquor. So I used to work upstairs in the banquet hall. And this that was a chore because everything had to be carried from a downstairs kitchen to an upstairs banquet hall, including tables, chairs, silverware, plates. And we also had to carry trays loaded with food up the stairs. There was no dumb waiter. We were the dumb waiters. Um, once we got into the banquet hall, um, we would, and sometimes we had as many as 250 people in that hall. It was a big hall. Deer, South Deerfield was a very popular tourist attraction. Oh, yes, yes it was, because they had large gatherings. The different groups of um, organizations would always have their banquets there, you know, for special occasions. And people came up here for vacation. They'd stay in the hotels and they'd take the trolleys and they, the train would come up. It was a very popular yes, place. Yes, mostly in the olden days when the Hotel Warren was um, a good place to stay. So what, what did you do after you finished working at the hotels? What was your next uh, I, uh, I continued work? to work at the hotel um, while I went to college. I went to Northampton Commercial College after I graduated from Deerfield High School. And uh, after my uh, time there, I was looking for some job locally. Uh, I did not want to travel far because I didn't have a car. And I found a job open at Ben's service station, which was in operation right across the Sunland Bridge on the right-hand side as you go across. And I went over and applied for the job, and they accepted me And as a bookkeeper. Um, I worked there, and not only did the bookkeeping, but I did <coughs> some babysitting. I did some lunch making for the help. 
I uh, used to deliver vehicles. I drove buses back to owners. I took the old pickup and went down to Worcester for parts when they needed something or Springfield. And um, I, I just got a, a good rounded education in, in driving. Uh -huh. Now, did most of your contemporaries in high school, what year did you graduate approximately? 1946. 46? Yes. Did most of your contemporaries go on to college or did most of them go off to work on farms? Mm. And did women go off to college or was that unusual for you to choose to do that? It was not unusual, but in those days, there were a lot of Polish people who needed their young people to work the farms for them. And so, unfortunately, a lot of the boys went to work on farms. But not all, because a number of them went to college. I would say probably maybe 10% of my class went to college because the boys were off to war. They all went. Oh, right. They were drafted and had to go to war. And so our class was diminished. I think we lost five boys that had to go off to war. And there were only 28 of us graduating at that time. So you can see that there weren't very many girls, but a lot of the girls had the same work, work ethic that I did, whether it was telephone operator or waiting on table or babysitting or whatever. We did whatever we could to earn money. And how did you decide to go to a commercial school in Northampton as compared to UMass Amherst or any other school? Well, I took a commercial college in high school. Um, my brothers had both taken college courses and it, it served them well. But as a girl, I felt that I would not have the funds to go to college. That was one thing. I didn't think I had the wherewithal <coughs> to pay for college and I needed something that would give me a chance to earn a living, and I felt a secretary would. You were very practical. Very, yes, oh, I tried to be. <laughs> and then, of course, from there, uh, I went on to work. Uh, there was advertised a work as a secretary at Deerfield High School and the school union 42 at that time, and that was the towns of Conway, Deerfield, Sunland, and Whateley, and the Deerfield High School. Can you give us a brief idea of the progression of your career at the school because you were known throughout t through the town also as a very important school official. Well, I did I did work for 40 years for the school department w before I retired. And what kinds of jobs? How did you get started and what kind of jobs did you well, have? Well, I went in as secretary to Superintendent Sidney Osborne, who again was only superintendent of Deerfield High School and the four towns because at that time we weren't regionalized. And then we went on to 1950, that was 1950. 1956, they regionalized. So that meant that now the high school was under a different set of um, supervisors. And they hired a superintendent principal for the high school and an assistant principal. And the Sidney Osborne be, was still the superintendent of the union and the four towns. Now. At that point in time, Sydney retired, and um, an, another superintendent came in, and uh, that was A.J. Goodwin, and uh, then we went on and had Joe Tinker and Jim Dowd, and at this particular time, they decided that the superintendent for the union was a non-necessity, and so they combined everything so that all the schools and everything was under one superintendent, and that was known as uh, Union, 38, Union 38 and Frontier Regional. Now, as things went on later, they decided in about 1960 that it wasn't working in the towns, so uh, um, Warren Bennett came in, and he was superintendent of the towns, and then he became superintendent over all the regional, and then it then dissolved into separate entities, and then again into one single entity under one superintendent. So there were a lot of changes that took place. <coughs> what kind of jobs have you had in the well, school? Well, I was secretary to the superintendent, and, and I stayed as secretary to, um, <coughs> well, I changed from the union. I decided that. I would go to work for the region. So it was a, a seamless change because it happened on July 1st of 1956 when the regional came into being. 
and as we went along uh, and then became merged again I merged back and and was still a secretary but by this time I was handling the business part of it I also was treasurer of the regional from 1960 on the uh, uh, treasurer who had been in was was a man from Conway and he decided to retire so I took over as treasurer also and then I was appointed as business manager so I retired as business manager and treasurer of Frontier Regional School. What year did you retire? I retired in 19, December 31st of 1989. So I've been retired for 26 years. Uh -huh. <laughs> was, there, was there a, uh, a party? Oh, they had a, for, for me? Oh yes, they had a big party. Uh -huh. And it was down at the restaurant that is, at, was at that time adjacent to the railroad station in Northampton. I remember that because the trains kept going through all the time we were there. Now, the most important job you had, <laughs> as far as the kids were concerned, which not everybody may know about, is Miss Santa Claus. Oh. Could you tell us about your distinguished career as a town Santa Claus, how that happened? I know you were anonymous, and what kinds of letters? Tell us about that experience. Well, it all started one day when the police chief came into the superintendent's office and said, you know, I got a letter from a kid. And he said, somebody needs to answer this letter. So he kind of pointed it in my direction and said, are you interested? And I said, yeah, I'll do it. Well, at that time, I had the office typewriter, so I stayed after work, typed up the letter, gave it back to the chief, and he took it and mailed it. Well, evidently word started to spread because then they put up a post office box specifically for Santa Claus and the letters came in. I used to type, uh, I had my own typewriter, I used to type in a red ink and I was very anonymous in doing this. Um, I would not promise the child anything, especially some of these letters, you know, were a page long with I want, I want, I wants. And I tried to suggest to them that um, being with their parents and doing good things and being a good child was very important as opposed to getting a lot of gifts. And so I tried to teach a lesson in every letter I wrote. And I kept copies of every letter that I got from children and every letter I wrote. And that went on. I, I did not want anybody to know who was writing the letters. It was anonymous. <coughs> and I don't think, except for the Postal Department, that anybody knew. But when I, I had retired and was still doing this, and I, it wasn't a large number of letters, but there were some times when we got 44, 45, 50 letters that I would answer in, in one season. And I would get letters from the same children year after year after year because they believed in Santa Claus. And um, some, it, some children it went on for six or seven years and it was, it was wonderful. But um, I finally uh, was told by the post office department that they were discontinuing the service. So I stopped writing the letters and uh, the little stamp, I had a little picture of Santa Claus on the bottom of every letter and a um, let Christmas letterhead at the top and I still have some of those letterheads that are not going to have writing on them anymore. Listen, children who are watching this show, I don't want to disillusion you. Yes, Virginia, there's still a Santa Claus. <laughs> let us not get disillusioned, is that correct? It's something I enjoyed doing very much, Ken. <clears throat> it was a pleasure. Um, to read some of those letters from those children and, and then try to give an appropriate response to them.